Hello and welcome to Private Ocean's webinar in partnership with the Marine Mammal Center, Ocean Optimism, Collaboration to Support a Healthy Ocean. I'm Greg Friedman, founder and CEO of Private Ocean. Joining me today is chef and sustainable seafood expert Jennifer Bushman and marine biologist Adam Ratner. Uh, Jennifer is one of the fish and seafood industry's most respected communicators, teachers, and sustainability strategists. She has taught thousands in her culinary school. Uh, nothing to it, which you should definitely check out. Um, it has been recognized numerous times by the James Beard Foundation and the International Association of Culinary Professionals. Adam, at his ripe young age of 19, joined the Marine Mammal Center in 2009, so pretty good. Uh, currently, it's Associate Director of Conservation Education. He was named one of the 30 under 30 game changers for the planet by the North American Association for Environmental Education and that one still gets my attention. I bet you your mother liked that one. Uh, serves as chair of the National Training Committee of the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, and is currently the executive chair of the Bay Area Climate Literacy Impact Collaborative. All that to say these people are highly qualified to talk about what they're going to be talking about. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Marine Mammal Center, uh, it's a private nonprofit organization whose mission is to advance global ocean conservation through marine mammal rescue and rehabilitation, uh, scientific research and education. Full disclosure, I'm on the board happily and a big, big supporter of all of this. Uh, you can learn more about the center by visiting uh, marinemammalcenter.org. And before I turn things over to Adam and Jennifer, uh, we will have Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, I will be turning off my camera, but I am not leaving. I'm listening. And uh, with that, thank you, Jennifer and Adam. Take it away. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, and for everyone for joining, we know there is a, a lot going on right now. It's a really tough emotional time. Um, we really appreciate just everyone who's coming and joining us today, and hopefully we can, can give you some good news, um, give you some, some updates on some things happening related to ocean health, um, and I'll be honest, I spent a fair amount of time looking up memes for this, so hopefully we'll get you to laugh a couple times as well. <laughs> um, what we'll do is we'll kind of run through the presentation. I'll share a little bit about the Marine Mammal Center, about climate change, and about ocean trash. And Jennifer will come in and talk a little bit about sustainable seafood right in the middle, and then we'll have a chance for questions at the end. I want to take uh, just a brief moment, though, before we jump into some of the ocean optimism elements of it all and just give a brief overview of what is the Marine Mammal Center, why Jennifer and I are talking about things like this. And as we try and advance these slides, um, of course we try all of this and it worked perfect. There we go, just a little bit of a delay. Um, I wanted to start before um, jumping into all of this just with a quote that has really resonated with me um, for many years, but particularly right now, this idea that it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And that's hopefully what we're gonna be able to do today, highlight some of the things that are happening that are really amazing progressive movements on big global ocean threats. Now, with that being said, um, I am based out of the Marine Mammal Center. So we are the world's largest marine mammal hospital and education facility. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take care of sick and injured seals, sea lions, whales, dolphins that are sick or hurt up and down the California coast as well as out in Hawaii, and really building up the next generation of scientists and stewards as a teaching hospital. So whether that's through visitors that come through our hospital, whether that's through visiting veterinarians and researchers, or whether it's through our volunteers and an amazing community of support with over 1,400 volunteers and donations from the community that help us do all of this amazing work. And what most people probably know us for is our rescue and rehabilitation work. The idea that we're out taking care and rescuing sick or hurt seals or sea lions like you see here. Um, and we might rescue 800 animals in a year. We might rescue 1,800 animals in a year. And the goal for every single one of them is the same. It's the day that they're feeling better, they've got that clean bill of health, they head back out to the wild happy and healthy again. And I can actually show that we released some animals back out to the wild just this morning, actually, with that second chance at life. And along the same path, we're also doing a lot of research. We're trying to figure out what's making these animals sick. What are the threats that they face so that we can help make sure they stay safe once they're back out into the wild. 
and also sharing that story, whether it's with other scientists or whether it's with that next generation of stewards through various online programs that we're doing like camp or online learning resources or through visitation programs and going into schools when possible. Now, with all that being said, what we wanted to focus on today are some of those big global ocean conservation topics. And I wanted to share just a couple more quotes um, before we jump into it. Um, I tend to think of myself as a pretty optimistic person. Um, I also come from an animal behavior and a psychology background, and I know that our brains are kind of pre-programmed to focus sometimes on the bad. Um, but we miss out a lot on some of the amazing good news that's happening, and that's what we wanted to bring to your attention today. It's not just about making you feel good as well. Um, one of the things that was really kind of um, game changing in a sense is a few years ago, a study came out that actually showed that those that had more hope and more optimism around issues like climate change actually did more to address it. Um, this idea that helplessness is paralyzing is actually playing out. So if people don't feel optimistic about these issues, they're less likely to take action around them. So the more we can bring these solutions to the forefront, the more we can actually create the progress that we need on things like climate change or overfishing or ocean trash. Now, what I wanted to do is start on climate change. And this is obviously a, a big topic. Um, I'm gonna pause for just a moment and give you the opportunity to look at the two comics because I admit I spent way too much time on Google trying to find them. Um, but what we'll do is for each of the topics, we'll kind of walk through what does the Marine Mammal Center do? What's our role? And then what are the things that different organizations, different governments are doing to take action on it? So to start with climate change, Basically, we've got a few different networks of support that we're a part of that are taking action on this. You heard um, Greg at the very beginning during the introduction share some very long acronyms more than anything else, and the acronyms don't get any better. Um, but I serve as the chair of the training committee for the National Network of Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, which is a group of around 400 individuals, 200 organizations that are all trying to share the same story on climate change. We took the best climate scientists, and we paired them up with social psychologists, and we scientifically tested how we talk about the science of climate change. And through that, we've actually been able to find some of these tools that people can use, whether it's metaphors or values. And by sharing those, we've been able to evaluate, it's been able to change the national discourse because all of these organizations combined are reaching hundreds of millions of people every single year. So a way that we can actually change the conversation on climate change for the better. In addition to that, I work with different groups within the North American Association of Environmental Education, or NAAAE, and this is across sectors in a sense. So you've got the school teachers, you've got the college professors, you've got religious and faith-based organizations, you've got the outdoor programs, all different groups, and creating kind of a mosaic of approaches. We don't need to recreate the wheel. Let's work together, figure out where we've been able to succeed and really leverage those successes for everybody. And then lastly, a group just in the Bay Area, since the main Marine Mammal Center Hospital is in Sausalito, right near the San Francisco Bridge, or the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, and this is an opportunity where let's get all the people together in the Bay Area that are working on this and help support them and bring together this community and collective impact around solutions we can bring forward with climate change. So all different ways we're trying to really advance the field and support others in taking action too. And when it comes to climate change, most of you are probably familiar with this picture, the, the woman that's featured in it. This is Greta Thunberg. And what's really amazing to me is actually the time scale that certain things have been happening as of late. So you probably know Greta's story at this point. She was time person of the year. She's been all over the news. What's amazing though is this picture that you're seeing was actually taken the very first day that she chose to strike outside of the Swedish capital. Most people, when I've been asking them, think that this happened years and years ago, actually, because Greta's been so much in the news. She's been such a game changer. But this photo was actually taken only around a year and a half ago. 
that's all. That's how long Greta has been around in that space and that popularity. And you think about where we've gone in the last year and a half from when Greta started that strike to now, where you've got marches that are taking place that have literally tens of millions of people around the world making their voices heard that they want climate action. So this just goes to show how quickly we can mobilize around action. You're seeing that now on various issues, whether it's COVID related, whether that's the social and racial justice issues, all ways that we can actually create huge change very quickly. Now, that's kind of the bigger part of the movement. I want to talk just a little bit about what are some of the kind of nitty gritty things that we're seeing that have made a really big difference. And if we look at the economics of climate change, everything is moving in the right direction. So right now, it is cheaper for most solar and wind projects than it is fossil fuels. So people can take sustainable action and good conservation behaviors without sacrificing very much. We can actually do the right thing and have it be cheaper. And those prices continue to drop. We've seen things like solar and wind um, costs dropping 60, 70 percent over the last 10 years. So it's now getting easier to do the sustainable thing. We fast forward and we think about where things are going to be going moving forward. It's already predicted that within the next 15 years, it'll be cheaper to build new solar and wind farms that actually run the existing natural gas plants. So take a moment to think about that. It's actually going to be cheaper to build new things than to run the existing ones in just 15 years. So this is going to be really game changing in terms of how we produce energy moving forward. And a lot of energy companies are jumping onto this. They're realizing that it is in their best interest, not just environmentally and morally, but economically. So you've got energy companies that are pledging to go 100% renewable. You've got groups that are making big commitments to drop their energy emissions really soon. And then you've also got the money that flows into a lot of these groups and the divestment that's happening. $11 trillion that's been divested from fossil fuel companies. So people are able to make their voices heard in a really big way. Now, this is happening from an economic level. This is also happening at a government level. So if you look at the international efforts that are taking place, you've got 70 major cities home to 425 people that have already pledged and committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. And, people, and groups and countries are joining onto these paths by the day in terms of more people taking action. You've got countries like China that typically are in the news a fair amount around being a major emitter, and they certainly are. The US and China are the top two carbon emission countries, but China's actually made some amazing progress already. So not only are they the number one producer of things like solar and wind energy, they've been able to cut their carbon intensity by close to 50% in the last 15 years and have met their goals early when they've been setting up. So we do have allies outside of the US that are doing a lot of things. In places like India, in France, in Norway, they've actually put in resolutions to ban and get rid of gasoline and diesel vehicles in the next 25 years. So you think about the transportation sector and how drastically that's going to be changing. Groups like Volkswagen are just only going to produce electric vehicles moving forward. So again, it's going to make it easier for people to take the right action moving forward. Now, Obviously, talking about international efforts, a lot of people are coming, are kind of thinking probably, well, what about the US? And there is no doubt whatsoever that the US has had to take a back seat to kind of the global climate change work under the current administration. But the day that President Trump actually said he was going to drop out of the Paris Agreement was when all of these groups that you're seeing up on the screen right now said, no, we're still in. So right now, you've got over half of the American population covered by a state or city that has pledged to meet the Paris Agreement. It's over half of the US GDP. It's 37% of our emissions. So this is still action that's happening. And if I'm going to be honest, I think it's actually been a real blessing to see the states and cities taking a lead. I wish a lot of things had been different over the last few years on climate policy. But 
we've now seen this groundswell at a local level where it's meaningful and it's long lasting, as opposed to simply waiting for an executive order from something kind of up at the top levels of government that are gonna dictate what happens. This is actually allowing the cities and states to build their plans and I think propels us forward as we have more people in the kind of throes of power of our government that can take action. And it's not just the governments that are doing things. From a business side of things, groups are stepping up in the void that was created from the federal space. So whether that's the big tech groups like Google, Apple, and Microsoft that are now 100% carbon neutral for their data centers and facilities, banks like Wells Fargo, you've got other groups like Lyft that have decided that they're gonna be carbon neutral, a transportation company that offsets all of those rides that take place. You've got groups that are pledging and ready to make that next step within the next year, whether it's Bank of America, Coca-Cola, Visa, that have all committed to 100% renewable energy within the next year. And then the bank movement as well, and the big banks that are saying they're not gonna finance fossil fuel projects anymore. And that makes a huge difference as well. And we've seen that playing out over the last year in particular, in terms of how we can really shift the markets and shift the mindsets of some of these big companies. Now, there's a lot going on, obviously. There's a lot that we can all do in our own lives. So I wanted to just share really quickly before I turn it over to Jennifer to talk about sustainable seafood, some of the things that we're doing at the Marine Mammal Center and that might be able to work in your lives. One of the big things is just where we get our energy from. And for many of us, you might not have many options. You may not be able to put things like solar panels on your roof, depending on where you live or if you rent or buy. But there are options out there. At the Marine Mammal Center, we do use solar panels, but we also use a CCA, a community choice aggregation, that allows us to get renewable energy produced offsite put into the grid. And there are groups in San Francisco, there are groups in Marin, like MCE, that allow you to get clean energy basically through your existing PG&E account without having to put solar panels on your roof. So it makes it easier to take some of these actions. We think about the work happening on transportation. Um, I use this picture because it's just honestly one of the cutest things ever, the idea of a walking school bus where kids are outside, they're interacting with nature, they're working together in their community, and they're also reducing things like emissions. And then food, where we know a lot of our emissions come from. And just a simple decision to skip one meat dish a week is equivalent to driving around 1,200 miles less a year. So there are simple things we can do as individuals, but also as communities, when we think about what we do at our homes, our businesses, schools, that can make a really big difference. So hopefully this gives you a sense of where we've seen a lot of progress on climate change, where there are some opportunities for us to continue moving forward. Now, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer to share a little bit about what's happening in the realm of sustainable seafood and overfishing. There's so much conversation right now, particularly about our food system and the realities of what we've seen, especially during COVID regarding chicken, beef production, cattle production, things that we'd already actually been thinking about for those of us that have been working in the sustainable space for many, many years. We knew that the carbon footprint and the energy efficiency of rearing these types of proteins was significantly troubling. But even more so, the issues now that we've seen around decentralized processing has even brought this more to the forefront. And of course, even in the last few weeks, some of the things that I think about in terms of food injustice and availability of good foods beyond just our food deserts begin to really help us begin to put a perspective and the lens around the impact that sustainable fish and seafood for all could make. And we can't have that conversation, particularly as it's World Oceans Day, World Oceans Week, World Oceans Month, if we don't start to talk about what is happening with our oceans. So we certainly, um, as Adam has said, we have these wonderful cartoons, but it is really important to look at the perspective of the animals as well as it relates to our fish and seafood consumption. Because the reality is our fish and seafood world has changed dynamically over the course of the last 30 years. In fact, we know that the oceans are actually either fished to capacity or overfished to the extent of 90%. So you think about the impacts that that has. 
not just in terms of what we eat, but also what we leave as it relates to the Marine Mammal Center in the oceans in order to be able to make sure there's enough for all. And there are a number of partners that have really thought about this. You know, we have um, a very important network of support and distribution that has come along over the course of the last several years. In fact, really over the course of the last decade. If we look, for example, at Seafood Watch, which many of you know about, I mean, this is an organization that's based out of um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and you may not know the story, but they wanted to carry sustainable fish and seafood in the aquarium when you would go to have lunch, and they started to put out a little table topper to show what those fish and seafood are that you should eat. And everyone that was visiting the aquarium started stealing those table toppers and they figured out, wow, we're probably onto something here. We should start to think about what the types of recommendations are that we are growing and, and what's happening there. And Seafood Watch is a program that came out of that. What it means now actually is that you have a tool. Uh, in this slide, you can see your phone, which is an app where you can look, download the Seafood Watch app be able to type in just as you're at the grocery store or looking at a menu what species that fish is and the country of origin and you'll know like a stoplight if it's rated green or yellow or red what that means for both reared fish meaning that fish that we're raising and the fish that's harvested is that you know that it's being done in what is the most sustainable manner now, there are a number of organizations that they actually work with, and so it's not that the marine, that Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch is basing it on its own science. Now we have, as Adam talked about, global collaborations to be able to make sure that we're getting good science, that we're getting into these communities good fishery management, and if there is aquaculture involved, that it's being done at the highest level. And so we look to them at the Marine Mammal Center as an important conservation partner, as well as the outreach that we do. And then the other thing that we've tried to do is create collaborations. Um, you might have seen Earth Day Eats, which was our first campaign where we came out with a group of top chefs. We talked about what, what sustainable seafood recipes look like and awareness. And you should know right now that in the market, this is becoming significantly important. Sustainability is not just about sustainability, meaning thinking about how something is raised or caught, is it coming from a fishery that potentially has had issues or is in depletion. It also can mean safety. So when we look at things that, like the incorporation of blockchain or other methods in order to truly know where our fish and seafood is coming from, and then we raise awareness by those bigger voices, the kinds of people like or on Top Chef, those chef advocates like Andrew Zimmerman and others, we can really raise the level of not just fish and seafood consumption, but also awareness of how important it is and the role that it can play in our food systems. And then the other thing is we're also starting to look at sustainable seafood as part of our center's effort in along the board of directors and the efforts that we're making. Because we know that we have to think all the time about what we're not only taking in terms of consumption levels as we're working with organizations like NOAA, but we also have to think about what we're leaving in the ocean. Because the ocean has this amazing ability to replenish itself if just given the chance. So those are the things that we're looking at. And there are incredible success stories. When we think about the California groundfish fishery, a fishery that was nearly completely decimated, and these are nuanced issues. When we think about the sense of in consumptive entitlement to ocean stocks. So for those of you that are tuning in, you may sit at a restaurant and ask, is the fish and seafood wild? And the minute that the, um, that the waiter says, no, it's actually farm raised, is the minute that you will not order it. We definitely have a sense of consumptive entitlement to what is in our oceans. And you may laugh, but I often ask in my work, when was the last time you asked if your ribeye was wild caught? You know, when did you ask if your chicken was wild caught? But what had happened was because of this and the way we looked at the oceans as production. And if you ask a fisherman, how much did it, what was the catch? What was the number of pounds they caught? We created a lot of issues. 
part of the issue was that when you think about fishermen and the legacy of passing that boat on from one person to the next in a family, your equity, the money that you've invested is often in the boats. If you have a fishery that has gotten depleted, and we've seen this throughout our coastal waters all across the United States, we know that what happens is those fishers keep going out and catching further and further and further away from the coastlines. And in one case, like our California groundfish fishery, we actually saw this area completely decimated. Organizations got involved in this. In 2000, the fishery was actually declared a federal disaster, which is very, very rare, by the way, but it was considered a fishery that was a federal disaster. And then that actually brought in good practices. We've raised money to buy those boats and get some of those fishers out of the water and out of a business where they weren't catching much fish anyway. We invested in areas that were economic zones so that we were actually making sure that these environmental areas were being able to be replenished and made sure that those concessions or those fishing licenses were also being properly managed. And the result, in 2020, that fishery was given a good alternative option in Seafood Watch. And actually now, when we look particularly at the rockfish fishery, this is one that's green rated. So order your rockfish tacos, make sure to see those when you're looking at your favorite fish counter to buy a wild fish that also is something now along our coast that's local. So we think about the carbon footprint of moving that fish from one place to another, something that has a very low carbon footprint and has a higher economic return because we're supporting local fishers. Now, the other thing is we need to start to think about what that balance is also in terms of how we raise our fish. So one of the things that we've decided to put a stake in the ground in is not just how these wild fisheries are managed, but also thinking about the role of sustainable aquaculture. Here's the reality. Fish provide about 3.2 billion people with almost 20% of their animal protein. So think about something that's closer to home. If you can't really relate to the fisher that's in Ecuador that's trying to catch mahi-mahi to feed his family, and think about how many times you see mahi-mahi on a menu, and maybe you assume it's from Hawaii, but it's not, because that is actually a very small fishery that is a pole and line caught fishery, and you'd be paying probably two to three times more for it. So the majority of the mahi-mahi that we Americans have gotten a taste for is coming from a red-rated fishery off of the coast of Ecuador. And I look at it and say, is my consumption more important than a local person being able to get access to that animal protein? You know, these developing island nations, Adam talked about climate change. And when we look at rising oceans, one of the most impact are those that are the island nations and those living along our coasts worldwide. So we have to think about what and where our protein comes from and how we get it so that we're leaving enough, not only for those that need it as a sustainable protein, and by the way, they're, the majority of them are managing their fisheries in the right way with two person boats, capturing just what they need on any given day. These are not large commercial fishing boats that have decimated essentially this region. Now, the other thing is, as I have mentioned already, if 90% of our ocean fisheries are harvested or exceeding capacity, and we have this growing love for fish and seafood, which we want, um, we do want you to eat more fish and seafood. The reality is that in the United States, we only eat 100, um, excuse me, we only eat 15 and a half pounds of fish and seafood as compared to the 160 pounds we eat of beef. And when we look at this from a nutritional perspective, it literally is that we're eating ourselves to death. The reality is not just from a climate perspective, but from a health perspective are that we need omega-3s and the greater nutrients that fish and seafood provide. But the reality is that 90% of our fish and seafood is brought into the United States, is imported. So we're not really utilizing as good as the Magnuson-Stevenson Act is, as good as there are opportunities to develop local sustainable aquaculture, we're not looking at that, particularly in the United States, as something that is important. And aquaculture is the fastest growing sector of protein production in the world.
and according to the World Health Organization, is not only important in terms of protein production, but is also the most sustainable one. So when we talk about this from the perspective of the Marine Mammal Center, we're really talking about those types of um, aquaculture projects that are raising fish at the highest level, the most sustainable, the most sustainable feed models that are antibiotic and chemical free. You can see in the corner here of the slide, this is actually Pacifico aquaculture that is a beautiful farm raising ocean raised true striped bass off of the coast of Ensenada. It has a thriving marine mammal population around it. It has very, very safe enclosed open ocean net pens that are actually in a submarine channel that helps the water flow through them. So all of the things that we look for in terms of effluence and healthfulness on a farm is really weighed just like you would think about, um, well, if chicken can be raised well, chicken can be raised badly. That's exactly what we look for in an aquaculture project. Not only that, but I want you to think about something there. Off of the coast of Mexico, those fishers had decimated their bluefin tuna population. And you've been hearing all of us talk about the fact that you really should not be eating bluefin tuna at all for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that we have actually got such an appetite for it that we're not allowing it to grow to reproductive years in order to be able to keep and, keep and sustain that population. On that farm, what they have done is they've developed a new economy. And what we say is that essentially, whether it's climate change, whether it's these solutions, sustainability is only as sustainable as our ability also to create economy and a, a true living wage for these fishers and for these ethical aquaculturists. Pacifico Aquaculture has over 200 employees and the majority of them are those fishers that had fished out their fishery. So we're allowing them to create an economy on the water in something that is an important growing and thriving population. So all of these things lead into the conversation about being at the top of the food chain, but also thinking about our marine mammal populations, the whales that are coming in that have been starving and a number of others where we are having significant issues because of global um, climate change and these fisheries being overfished. Essentially, these marine mammal populations can't find enough to eat. Now, these business efforts have been significant and you may be following them as well we have organizations like Red Lobster that have joined the Seafood Watch program. So where Adam talked about groups that were coming on board, like not just Google, but other significant um, uh, businesses, we have the same thing in the fish and seafood space, where what we're doing is we're putting programs in, in conjunction with Monterey Bay Aquarium, Seafood Watch, and others. For those of you that are foodies, like the James Beard Foundation and other restaurant groups, where we're saying, look, we're gonna stand by this and we're gonna really, although the consumer may not be thinking about it, we're gonna make sure that it's rated, that it's on menu so that you, it takes the guesswork out for you. You sit down, you go to a restaurant and you know that everything they're sourcing is sustainable. A local example of that is Pacific Catch Restaurant Group. We have had incredible programs with them, not just in terms of fundraising, but also in terms of awareness. So you can sit down and you can eat a seal approved meal where it's a meal that has been reared or harvested, but not at the expense of our marine mammals getting their dinner. And other groups like Thai Union and Chicken of the Sea that have all teamed up to accelerate sustainability in areas like Southeast Asia, for example, there are over 4.6 million shrimp farms in Vietnam, and now we have organizations like Smart Catch and others, the Asian Shrimp Initiative, which Seafood Watch is a part of, that are helping those families, teaching them how to raise their shrimp in a better way so that we don't have the type of mangrove destruction that we have seen around unsustainable shrimp farming. So the idea really is that all of these pieces have to come together. We know that with ocean change, we're looking at land-based farms. We're looking at, for example, McFarland trout, which is nearby us. We're also looking at things like sturgeon farms, working with UC Davis in order to be able to save what was the native California sturgeon by raising best-in-class sturgeon, even caviar for these great restaurants that you know are in our area. 
And then we're also supporting things like Seafood Watch and Marine Stewardship Council, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. Those are both part of the World Wildlife Foundation's efforts to bring more sustainability in, in our organizations and making sure that there's awareness. And one of the most important things that you can do is you can ask where your seafood comes from. It may not be the right information. Your waiter or waitress or that seafood fish and seafood counter worker, they may not know. In fact, fish and seafood changes hands more times than any other um, thing that you eat, up to nine times. It's where blockchain and you being in really educated is where the, that's going to make the most important impacts. But it all starts by asking, where did this come from? Do you know? And really starting that dialogue of education between the person that you're interacting with. Look where you're spending your money. If there's information, you know, you can go to the Pacific Catch website, you can go to other restaurant groups websites, even groups like the Cheesecake Factory, large scale groups, not just small, but large restaurant groups where the buying power is so significant, where we can make the biggest impact. And so it's all of these pieces, I think, that we're starting to put together to be able to create what we think are the impacts at the Marine Mammal Center. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Jennifer. That mm -hmm. is fantastic. Um, so there are some questions, shockingly. Uh, that was great. And I actually know you and I've heard you. Uh, are you, Adam, do you have more? Yeah, I was going to just speak for a couple quick minutes um, around ocean trash, and then we'll be able to, to answer Perfect. all those questions that you have. So kind of rounding out um, the big three global ocean health kind of threats, in a sense, between climate change, overfishing, and ocean trash. And, and I think ocean trash gets a fair amount more attention than overfishing, and I'm not sure it deserves that. But it is the thing that's just so tangible, the thing that you can see. Um, and the good news is, is that even though it is a really big problem, there are a lot of different groups that are taking action. The Marine Mammal Center has been at the forefront of this, um, working with business partners and other NGOs as part of, part of the Trash Free Seas Alliance. Also working through kind of government in a sense and working with people in Marin County as part of the kind of regional task force for Zero Waste Marin. And then also the action piece of it and actually working to collect trash during things like Coastal Cleanup Day and partnering with other organizations that are taking action as well. And what's been really amazing in my mind is just how much action and targeted action has been taking place around plastics in particular. Plastics are obviously a great thing but we're not necessarily using them appropriately. So plastic can last forever. Um, and that's where we're seeing these problems with all the single use plastics. But for example, the EU actually just passed a single use plastic ban for 10 of the most common items out there. You think things like the plastic bags, the bottles, the straws. So that's the entire EU that's phasing out the use of some of these big plastic items. Just this year, China actually passed their own plastic bag ban. So they are taking action. So this is millions upon millions of pieces of plastic that are no longer going to be in circulation. India has also taken action. So Mumbai already passed a plastic packaging ban and it's expected to go nationwide for all of India within the next two years. And then things like Vancouver to the north of us, banning things like straws, foam cups, takeout containers. So we're seeing a huge movement and huge areas that can also help shift the market to more reusable or compostable packaging. And we're seeing the businesses getting involved here because no business wants to be responsible for ocean trash or for climate change. And a lot of them have come together under this plastic pack. All these big companies, the Coca-Colas, the Unilevers, the Pepsis, they're responsible for 20% of all the plastic produced globally. And they've all come together and said within the next five years, all of the plastic packaging that we're going to be using will be reusable, recyclable, or compostable. So just like you heard from Jennifer, the idea here is to make the options easier for all of us. So when you go to a restaurant, you don't need to necessarily ask a bunch of questions because that restaurant has pledged it's going to use sustainably caught seafood. We want to make it so that when you go into a store, 
what you're buying, you don't have to weigh the value of that product with the destructive properties of its packaging. Let's just make it easier for everybody. And there are lots of solutions that are already out there, things that we can do in our own communities, our own organizations, particularly looking at the use of single-use plastics. Um, one of the things that's been really kind of amazing to me is I used to rely on things like Ziploc bags so much or Saran wrap. And there are now environmentally friendly versions of those using things like beeswax. So ways that we actually have the solutions, people just might not know of them yet, but the more we talk about this, the more we let the companies know our thoughts, the more we can shift all of these different behaviors. So that's how we can make a lot of progress on these big ocean health topics. It's using our voice, letting companies know that we care can make a big difference. Now, what I wanna do, I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for questions. I wanted to end on just a couple quick things. This is a quote by an environmentalist and author, Paul Hawken, um, that has always resonated with me a lot because as I mentioned, I'm an optimistic person, but I also spend every single day dealing with the science of things like climate change and ocean trash. And I think this kind of two sides of the coin are really shown here in this quote. If you look at the science about what is happening on earth and aren't pessimistic, you don't understand data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore the earth and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. And that really is, I think, where we have the opportunity is that there are so many people, there are so many solutions. And the more we empower and inspire people, the more we can grow that community. So hopefully with that, we've given you a little bit of some good news. Um, we've given you a little <laughs> hope and optimism. Um, figured I'd, I'd finish with our, our last two things that I found off of Google while looking for various memes. And then please do know that you can always connect with us as well. We are a community of stewards, of scientists and supporters. Um, so you can always learn more, join our community at, on our website or social media. Um, and then Jennifer didn't mention it, so I'm going to mention it for her. There is an amazing campaign that we did last month working with the top chefs. All of the recipes are up on our website. There are cooking videos. Um, so a great way to see how sustainable seafood can be absolutely delicious at home. So I definitely recommend that. But with that being said, I'll turn it over um, to Greg for some questions. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen just so that we can see everyone's face since I haven't seen anything since I've been <laughs> looking at his own screen. So Greg, what questions do we have? Uh, so we have a few, that was fantastic. Um, I'm particularly inspired by China and India. Uh, that was news, I did not know that Actually, there's a number of things in there, even though I know you guys, and I, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. So I find that personally really exciting because obviously those are big numbers. Um, so here's a couple, uh, for uh, no particular order, uh, but I thought this was interesting. How is COVID-19 uh, impacting efforts on climate change, overfishing, ocean trash, you know, all the issues you're you're hitting? I thought that was a great question. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to, to maybe the climate and the plastic side, and then I'll have Jennifer jump in on the, the seafood side. Um, COVID-19 is, is obviously a, a, a tragedy. There, there's no two ways around that. Um, for some of the different things that you might hear in the news around energy emissions dropping because of COVID-19, that's not the right conversation, in my opinion, because we're not going to solve climate change by having a lockdown and having everyone suffering. What I think it has highlighted, though, is how quickly we can mobilize. Um, you've seen people come together, not just individual actions, but these whole collective movements, trying to protect people, the reconnecting with nature. That's really inspiring. And I think it's also highlighted that there are solutions out there that can make a really big difference. We think about increased access for things like working from home. That drastically cuts down on the transportation emissions, makes it easier for people if we provide the right infrastructure to do that. Um, and then we've seen groups, um, whether it's cities or even at the state level, that have been shutting down streets and opening up more areas for people to do active transportation. I think those are the things that are gonna be the most long lasting from the COVID-19 situation because it highlights these win-win solutions out there. Let's protect people and let's protect the environment. So Jennifer, I know the, the seafood industry has been hit pretty hard from this as well. Do you wanna share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the 
It, it absolutely has. There's no doubt when you have the majority being sold into restaurants and somehow the math doesn't always work out because food service doesn't equal what we were buying at retail. In fact, the majority of your fish and seafood purchases were in restaurants. Um, but there, the good news is that, and I'm like you, there's always good news in this, in these um, issues. The good news is that people started to think about eating more healthfully. And for the first time ever, given my background, you know, as a cookbook author and things, I mean, I wasn't saying you need to cook at home. Let's all eat together around the kitchen table because it was, it was happening um, out of necessity. And again, sustainability is going to equal safety. And it also, in some ways, is also going to denote nutrition. So we want to have safety in our supply chain. We want to believe that a food is going to come to us and it's going to come to us in the safest, best way handled as possible. And so it really is helping boost what was the impact of some of these larger companies as they think about reopening in order to have something that's um, definitely sustainable on the menu. And of course, it also, as, our, as, as aquaculture goes, one of the things that, for better or for worse, that people don't know is that the Trump administration actually has gotten very involved because you want to look at if you're importing 90% of your fish and seafood and there are places where you can develop economy and you could potentially give support, whether it's land-based farming, whether it's better fishery management for sales or developing aquaculture in areas where it wasn't going to be, um, there was no route to get it there, um, some open ocean net pen development. All of those conversations with NOAA now have really been boosted by an executive order that was um, signed three weeks ago. So I think it's, yes, there's a lot of fish and seafood out there. And I want everyone to know that you never were going to starve. We could have filled all the cases with fish and seafood when the chicken and the beef and the pork went away or it went up too high in price. But what this, what this has done is it's shown us that we have to have food justice. We have to have equality for all. And we can do that at a lower price by bringing, really utilizing our own local fish and seafood, using freezer techniques and getting it into areas at a lower price because it is with caught or raised in the United States. And I think that that's going to be the opportunity. We need fish and seafood to be available for more people and we need it to be on menus and in cases um, in the way in which it's also represented with the other proteins. That's excellent. Um, just in respect to time, I'm gonna, I'm going to just one more question, and I, I would love it if you both answered it. So you both covered a lot of ground um, in, in different areas, obviously uh, overlapping, but different areas. And uh, I can tell you that uh, as someone who starts to go down this road or sort of turns and says, okay, I need to be more, uh, you know, I need to be uh, you know, more intelligent about this, and I need to be more intentional about what I'm doing. Uh, you immediately get, here's 500 things you should do, here's, you know, you, it's just, right? So maybe, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm going to put you on the spot and prioritize, but, uh, and I'll, but I'll give you this bandwidth. I won't let you stick to one. What are two things, right? What are two things that you have to just narrow it down to two? It's the only two that people are going to do that would have the biggest impact that you think you know, boy, if a lot of people did that in mass, that single, those two things among the millions would be amazing. Take a shot, either one of you, or both of you, actually. Adam, you go first. Oh, that's unfair. <laughs> um, all right, so I, I love the leeway that you gave us two things. I'm going to cheat a little bit and say that voting doesn't count as one of those two because that's just something we all have to do. Um, so that's that's a given. Yeah. Um, I'll give you voting for both of you. I, I, I know. <laughs> um, so for because these are all different topics, there's no one silver bullet to address overfishing and climate change and ocean trash. I would say find what's really passionate to you. So if there is a cause within those, let's start there. Um, and I think what my biggest suggestion would be is whatever solution you go with, whether it's you really want to promote renewable energy and solar and wind, or if you want to focus on the single-use plastics, don't do it by yourself. Um, individual action is really important, and it gives you a great sense of personal success. But bring people along on that journey. Whatever the solution is, try and bring it to a bigger scale. So that would mean if you want to 
take action against single-use plastics. It is amazing to say, I'm never gonna use another plastic bottle again. Go another step farther and say, all right, at my business, I'm going to talk with people and we're gonna get it so that there are no single-use plastic bottles in this business. Or we're going to make sure that the entire cafeteria at my kid's school doesn't use plastic silverware. Take it to that level, because that's gonna be where the more people are involved, the more people that are seeing this great action, the more people are talking about it, that's gonna carry so much more weight than you doing something in your own personal home and then keeping quiet about it. Everyone's looking for solutions. Help mobilize people to that bigger thing around the topic that you're really passionate about. Okay, great, thanks. And so as far as as far as mine, I think it's 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 relatively easy. The first thing is know where your fish and seafood comes from. Ask the question. That's just starting there. We'll put that um, idea into the mindset of that fish and seafood counter worker, that waiter, that um, restaurant about the fact that you actually care where it came from. And if if you're knowledgeable and you're using that seafood watch app, you can maybe even teach them something. And then the other thing I'm going to tell you as this is a balanced solution. So I'm not saying that the solution is not going to come from all areas, but we have got to change the narrative around how we feel about raising fish and seafood. So I'm just going to put out there to you, if you just start supporting your water farmers in whatever way you can, that can be oysters, that can be seaweed, if that's what you're comfortable with, it doesn't have to be salmon. That's usually the bad actor that people get worried about, but I want you to look for McFarland trout, look for sterling sturgeon, look for these water farmers, Pacifico striped bass. We have got to start changing the narrative of wild versus farmed and understanding that it is wild and farmed that are gonna create a balanced ecosystem that will save our oceans. You know, just to build on the farming for a second, um, I know that just as a layperson consumer, I had always heard that farm raise was bad and the, the knock on it was always, you know, imagine 8 billion salmon in a two by two pen, you know, and the, and the water quality and all this kind of stuff. Right. And so the assumption was it would just be bad. I, I think that right there is the pro and I don't even know where I ever heard that. I have no idea where I would get that idea. You know, I'm just saying that's pretty big campaigns. And, and to be honest, I mean, uh, when we think about where was corn farming in the 1970s and there were no organic options, um, we started in the 1980s with GMOs, we built a narrative. And, and I think anybody that has seen the progression of aquaculture, which is a relatively new part of our food system at scale, it's been, it's been around for hundreds of years, but at scale only around for the last 30, we did, we had bad practices, but bad practices evolve technology, feed models, um, pens that are like the Pacifico pens. Most sustainable aquaculture only has 2% fish and 98% water in the pens that you were looking at in those open ocean net pens. So that, yeah. that narrative just doesn't hold any longer. Well, and, it, and it really does speak to, oh, oh, sorry, Greg. I was just going to say, it really does speak to how quickly things are evolving as well. That like what you heard was not untrue back in the day. Um, and there are these misperceptions um, around things like solar energy being much more expensive. But because so many people are doing things and we're taking action, it's changing that story. So it's coming back to some of those original ideas and seeing how much improvement we've actually made because we just keep hearing about the problems a lot. Fair enough. Well, one more question, because I'm super interested in aquaculture and there are questions coming in on that. Um, <laughs> a, a person wants to know about, and I think this is a great question, um, can you speak to how aquaculture operations are graded and things like that? I mean, essentially yeah. that's the issue, right? What's the quality? I think it goes to everything. Yeah, saying. and it is very, we'll just, we just need to set up another webinar on that, I'm afraid. Uh, it's a very nuanced um, question, but what I can tell you is like a fishery, when, when you see a stoplight um, and it's red, you stop, you don't drive through it. Um, that fishery is rated on a lot of different things to, to be able to tell that it's not healthful and it's overfished. A farm is the same way. A farm will be with antibiotic use and with chemical use and not doing their escapes where if and mainly we're talking about open ocean net pen right now, but if there were escapes or those things, it would be rated red. Um, and so when you use that seafood watch app, 
and you look up a farm by name, then it, and it's red rated, that's not a farmed fish that you would want to be eating. Um, ASC certification, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council is very hard to get. So if you find a fish that is an ASC rated fish, you know, it's like a green light, you're good to yeah. go. So I wanna say a couple things in closing. First of all, I, I on behalf of Private Ocean, we definitely want to thank you so much for for this information and for doing this. Um, I'm taking you up on your offer, so everybody can look for our follow up webinar on aquaculture because I'm super interested in hearing more, and I'm guessing I'm not alone. And you know, basically, people can get more information. Go to the MarineMammalCenter.org website. Uh, are there any other places you would send them uh, in particular? I would check out your culinary not for I can't remember the name of it, but what is it? nothing to lose, nothing, <laughs> nothing to it. <laughs> the there is um, a group, the um, ratings and partnership collaboration. I think that one. It's a group of NGOs that has looked at um, all coming together: MSC, ASC, Seafood Watch. It's really led by Seafood what Watch and the FAO. Uh -huh. the, it's the ratings and partnership collaboration. And that yep. one is a really important one because what it does, like, like what Adam was saying was it takes all that information and it drills it down into exactly where we are, how we're assessing those farms, those ocean, how far we've gotten and what we need to look for, for the future. That's fantastic. Well, thank you. I'm leaving much more optimistic than I showed up. So mission accomplished. Thank you guys so much. Fantastic. Right, my pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks for everyone for joining today.